The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Charter Communications, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have two members, one both from the House of Delegates, uh, Delegate Chris Hayes, right? Cliff Hayes. Cliff Hayes. I'm sorry, sir. Good to see you. It's good to see you as well, Woody. It's wonderful being here this morning. Thank Delegate you. Delegate Chris Jones, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Good to see you again. Good morning, Woody. For the ninth time, I guess, we're together on That's right. And maybe the last time here in the basement. Last time in the basement. <laughs> GAB will be gone before we know it. Uh, that's a good thing, and I hope uh, there's room for uh, WCVE when you come in, back in the new building. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Hayes, you are a freshman member of the House of Delegates. Uh, how has the transition been from local government, the city council, to the House of Delegates? Well, I tell you, um, it's uh, quite a difference in the two, and um, everything moves much quicker at a much faster pace in a smaller window of time, and um, it really, really, really is an eye-opening experience from this side of the perspective and um, it's just a great time being here also being able to take care of the people's business and work alongside with great people like our chairman uh, Chris Jones uh, we've worked together over the years as he's represented parts of Chesapeake and it's just wonderful to be able to step into this part of the district and represent uh, the 77 parts of Chesapeake and Suffolk. Tell us a little bit about your, your district especially in terms of how it's doing e economically yeah, it's quite an interesting district uh, because um, it's a working class district in parts of South Norfolk, Indian River, Camelot, um, Airline Boulevard Corridor. Th those are the main portions of the city of Chesapeake. And then uh, East Washington Street in the Suffolk area, um, you're talking uh, in terms of education. Uh, uh, some of our, I guess, more challenged schools in Chesapeake and Suffolk. Um, just um, a working class uh, community there that work real hard on a daily basis and we want to do what we can to help the quality of life issues in the district. So what supports the economy there generally? Um, I guess in South Norfolk area you have a lot of folks who work with the shipyards um, mm -hmm. along the Elizabeth River as well many businesses along there we have the Cavalier Industrial Park as well as part of the Chesapeake portion of the district and then in Suffolk uh, we have some uh, working class areas, um, I guess the planters, peanuts, mm. and other businesses, industrial, along that East Washington corridor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, where are we on the budget, sir? Well, today it will be on the floor of the House in the Senate. The Senate has um, Senate Bill 900. We have House Bill 1500. Uh, we'll go to the floor at noon, and then hopefully by two-ish or so we'll have the budget. Uh, both chambers will be approved, and then on their way to each the other chambers and then uh, we'll put them in conference next week and we'll start rolling our sleeves up about uh, 10 or 12 of us I guess and then we'll get, be done by the uh, 25th of March. So what are some of the major differences as you understand them between uh, the Senate and the House at this point? Well we have much more in common I think than not. We did both did the 3% state employee raise, we both did uh, the adjustment for the uh, capital, I mean for the um, state police, we both did compression for deputy sheriffs, we took a little bit different approach on the teacher uh, side of the equation. We put money in lottery, additional dollars that could be used for a pay raise. And the Senate actually took some existing dollars, like $28 million, and put it in, to, in with the governor's $55 million. That was for a bonus. So while we are different, it looks from afar, we're pretty similar in the dollar amounts that we have in the respective parts of the budget. So I don't foresee a real difficult conference. So what kinds of things are you looking at uh, in detail in terms of the budget and the process? Yeah, uh, as Chairman Jones mentioned, there are a lot of key issues and important things that I guess we're starting out. Uh, you get to hear um, what that sentiment, the tone will be going into the session. And it's just nice to have, uh, I guess, some folks who not only are going to look out for the entire Commonwealth as a chairman, but also to know that he represents uh, Chesapeake as well as Suffolk. 
it's great to be able to look at that pie, if you will, and have a piece of it in your district and have things, interests of, 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 of your district and the locales that we represent. But it's even better to have, in the case of our chairman, a hand on the knife that's going to be actually, you know, carving up portions of it. And it's just great to, to, to have his leadership. So, so how important are teacher raises to, to your constituents and raises to other state employees, especially those who protect us like uh, our state police? Yeah, so our state police have been in an interesting situation. We know how important safety is to us and for, um, I guess, in the past to be in a situation where we have a, uh, um, a, a less than full complement of uh, troopers who are out on the roads taking care of the safety of the, of the roads across the Commonwealth to know that we're being able to do some things to incentivize those roles to attract new persons to those roles and as well as maintain and keep the great uh, employees that we have. One of the poorest problems that we've experienced is uh, the recruitment of those troopers to other public safety roles, whether it's with the federal government or even other local police departments, uh, has been quite a challenge. But I think uh, both houses, as well as the governor, stepped up during this session to look at how we might be able to maintain and sustain those important positions. In the way of education, to have, you know, uh, you know, those teachers on the front line that are touching every life uh, of our young people is just is, is good for us to show that commitment to, to education as well and to show that those teachers are appreciated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the term compression mm -hmm. in relation to deputy sheriffs. Can, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, in the last probably five years we've had um, a couple pay raises and one of them in particular dealt with compression. Uh, we did several years ago for state employees. We're doing a similar thing this year for the uh, deputy sheriffs. If they are a law, if law enforcement are sworn, then they would in essence uh, get an $80 per year of service for every year between 3 and 30 added to their uh, paycheck and if they're not they get a $65 and what has happened to Cliff's point trying to maintain and hire a, a workforce you see the starting salaries have moved up without a like move by the people who've been there for maybe 8, 10, 12 years so the compression issue was if you say it's based on years of service you get additional monies to be in here 10 years longer than a colleague, you get an extra $800 compared to what they would get if they've only been here 10, you've been here 20. So the speaker has, uh, last year we passed, um, I forget the bill number, but it was to have a commission looking at compensation and the state workforce in retirement. So we passed a bill resolution, I should say, in JLARC that's going to do a compensation study for the Commonwealth. We had to put about $200,000 into that. So they're going to come back working with DHRM and they'll come back to us hopefully in the fall and show us where we're not, we're not as competitive with the private sector for like nurses, attorneys, mm -hmm. all the above, how we're fair vis-a-vis -vis, uh, law enforcement. And I would see us making a, a much larger investment over the next several years into our workforce once we get that pay plan back. Now why is it important that state employees get a pay raise versus the initial suggestion by the governor that there would be a one-time bonus? Well, one-time bonus, you, it doesn't affect your, your final compensation, and it doesn't move your, your, your pay that you get each and every week. So that would go away after the first year. And if we known last year what we knew, you know, what we know now, we wouldn't have done some things. We would have put the pay raise on the front side, not on the back side. So in the budget that is on the floor today, we went and took all new initiatives out. We took items that had just been started, and we repurposed those dollars towards compensation for our employees. Because, you know, they're our greatest asset. They have to deliver the services in the mental health hospitals and, you know, the state police and, you know, regulatory um, issues that our citizens have to deal with. So we felt that compensation was a number one issue coming into the session. Great. Uh, Doug Hayes, uh, talk to us about the committees you serve on, and then I want to get into some legislation that you are sponsoring this session. Sure. So uh, the two committees that I've been assigned to are the uh, city, counties, and towns, as well as the health, welfare, and institutions. So I take it cities, counties, and towns is right in your wheelhouse, so to speak, because you came from, from local government. That is correct. I served two terms, eight years, on the Chesapeake City Council, and um, it was uh, quite interesting process there uh, in learning 
about all the local issues that one could potentially uh, face and um, to be able to continue that on here in a, in a role um, from the perspective of the state, but also bringing with that uh, in my uh, toolbox, if you will, a lot of experience dealing with local uh, city council oriented issues or is just a good, a good place to be. I think it's a great fit. And what kinds of issues have you had the opportunity to address on health, welfare, and institutions? Well, there are a myriad of issues there. Um, I think uh, one dominating uh, theme or common theme this time around has been this whole mm -hmm. piece about opioid uh, addiction and painkillers. And uh, it's just interesting how at one, at one time uh, a community across the Commonwealth or the country, if you will, could could look at a situation of dealing with pain and pain management in such a way that we wanted to help individuals deal with some of the uh, pretty difficult situations that they were dealing with, only to find that we might have been, uh, may have been over prescribing uh, in the area of painkillers, et cetera, uh, and now trying to do what we can to kind of fix that situation. Um, just listening to the testimony and the studies that have been done along the way um, and to see everyone coming together to see what we can do to address that issue is just uh, it's a it's a good good feeling to be from that perspective and apparently fixing that issue uh, is, is 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 something that, that that will occur but unfortunately a lot of those people who will no longer be able to get prescriptions as a result of their gaming the system uh, so to speak are turning to heroin sure and um, uh, that's you know, a pretty rough situation as well, and um, we've had, uh, I think, I forget the sheriff's name from Chesterfield County, but there's a, a pilot situation going on there where I think it was uh, Delegate Kilgore and others to look at helping uh, look at. I mean, this sheriff has really stepped up to say that, you know, as people were being jailed because of the addictions that they had had, uh, he saw that it wasn't working to have them detox and be incarcerated only to release them back uh, to a community and then find that folks are turning back to what they think the levels of, uh, I guess, intake that they had before actually were causing situations of overdoses. And so he's opened up his facility to, to bring them back, even though they may not necessarily have had a sentence per se, uh, just doing the right thing. Uh, to try to help people deal with those addictions. Well, we'll get back to you on some election law matters that you're sponsoring, but uh, there is a tax amnesty bill that mm -hmm. you're carrying this session. Talk to us about uh, uh, the relevancy of that towards the uh, uh, the budget. It's been our fourth time we've done it. We did it in 1989, I think 2003 and 2009. Should generate about 58, 59 million dollars in general funds to come back into. Is that based upon the history of when we've based done Based on these? history and outstanding uh, you know, delinquent taxes and there are certain conditions in there we don't know when it's going to happen because you don't want to let people know because it can potentially right. gain the system. But we think that it will generate about 58 million dollars. The Senate's taken a more aggressive approach and they've added another 31 million to it. I think they really want to spend it in conference. Uh, but you know, we have language to say any money is above what is uh, estimated in tax amnesty will go into a reserve fund that we don't touch. And so that will generate uh, about, like I said, 58. We've got the Nexus bill, which is Amazon. And we did a, a, a deal with them about five years ago, six years ago, saying anything that in their fulfillment centers in Virginia, they would collect and remit taxes for those items. But they have a lot of, um, in their fulfillment centers, they have a lot of product that is from other entities that really do not quote unquote on Amazon but they house it and it's sold and fulfilled by Amazon. So that would generate about another I think 18 or 22 million. So there's about four or five tax items that the governor had introduced and I think we're going to pass three of them which will generate about 90 to 100 million dollars which went a long way quite frankly to, frankly, to paying for the compensation package and some other things. Give I, us, go ahead I'm sorry. I did want to follow up on what Cliff was saying. Last year we had about I forget the number 3.6 million in the budget for um, programs within the jails. So we have mm -hmm. six pilots that are ongoing. Uh, Delegate Cox actually had the budget amendment dealing with the program that's down in Chesterfield to kind of expand that around. And they're doing a lot of good work there and we have to approach it you know, comprehensively. And that's why the mental health reforms are so important. Same day access and you know, all the above plus working with those who have uh, opiate addictions. 
Give us a sense of perspective about this $1.5 billion deficit that you're dealing with. Compared to the total budget, what percentage is that? Well, we probably have about, uh, that's over a two-year period, it's about 1.2 now. We had additional revenues because the economy has improved. That was uh, done back in November. We have about $38 billion in general funds, generally. So if you do the $1.2 billion, you can do the math there. Uh, it's manageable, but you do have to go in and, and, and make some difficult choices and prioritize like you do at home. I mean, you know, when we're sitting around the kitchen table, my wife and I have to decide, well, what are we, you know, where can we spend this? What can we do uh, in that regard? And that's no different for the state government. When we can't print it. We have to earn it before we can, you know, spend it. We're not like the federal government. So uh, in the committee rolled their sleeves up, working with the subcommittee chairman, and we went through, and if it was just in, we took it out, and it was a new program. We, you know, we didn't really do it. And uh, we repurposed those dollars into mental health, uh, domestic violence. We put $1.5 million in the budget, uh, we put that back in. Because we can leverage that four to one. So that will get us $6 million uh, in federal dollars that will be able to be matched and then help with de shelters and all the above for the families that have a, a domestic violence need and have to get out of a situation that's very unfortunate. And I understand we're going to hold public education harmless. K yes, through 12. Uh, the governor's introduced budget actually held them harmless in 17 and, and 18. He held higher ed harmless in 17, but they took a 5% cut in uh, 18. What the House did, we've got about 12 to $15 million more in our budget than the governor has in his introduced budget for uh, education, K-12. Then we have about $21 million more in our budget than what he had for uh, higher education. So collectively, we've got about probably 30, 32 million dollars more in those two areas of education than we're in, than we're in the introduced budget. What about the community colleges? Oh uh, yeah, they were, I met with them last week. They're they're very pleased overall with our approach. Now the Senate took a much different approach. Uh, they didn't add any new dollars, uh, quite frankly, to uh, higher education from what, what we can tell. So that'll be a, a, an area of uh, you know, of um, I guess a larger area of us dealing with in the conference where we end up and where we land. Uh, Delegate Hayes, you've got uh, some legislation that you've been pursuing dealing with uh, uh, the Code of Virginia on election law matters. I think uh, one dealing with the ability to vote absentee uh, if you're above a certain age. Sure. Uh, the other dealing with the reasons why one can vote absentee. Talk to us about those. Well, in our district, uh, we had a gentleman, uh, Mr. James McNeil, Reverend McNeil, who uh, now is uh, well into, I guess he's about 95 years old, and uh, he just inquired about this whole thing of having to go out to the polls on that day and just, uh, I guess, made a whole lot of sense to me, um, saying, you know, once the folks know who I am, I've been registered, I've been voting since, you know, I was able to vote, and so everyone knows who I am, uh, but some days I just don't, feel up to making it out and doing some of the things that on other days I can tackle eight or nine things. And um, so he pointed to uh, a rather historic election going back to 08 and how, um, you know, sometimes things just happen. And in that case with uh, Reverend McNeil on election day while he was planning to go out a little later to the polls and um, only to have his house catch on fire. Hmm. and. Um, uh, what a disruption, right? So later on in the day, still thinking that he wanted to get to the polls to vote because it was such a priority to him, um, only to find that the lines were extremely long. We know the, the historic turnout that we had during that time. But um, just knowing that sometimes things happen, and if he could have gone prior to that day to vote, then he certainly would have on one of those other days, one of those other opportunities. And um, so we just felt that uh, we wanted to try to support him on that. And so we put in legislation, hopefully, to see what we could do to deal with it. Uh, we know that there's a difference in uh, how we feel today. Um, the new, I guess, 65 isn't what it used to be. Right. And um, many of our seniors are able to get out and about uh, a little bit better than in past years and at older ages. But um, just on the flip side of that, some days, you know, you just have better days than others. So we just wanted to try to support him on that. Great. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, get back to what the chairman was saying. It's just interesting as we talk about 
national budget, and we all know that there are just unlimited demands and uh, limited resources that we have to deal with in 45 days. It's just uh, quite, you know, almost overwhelming to think of how much has to be done in just that short window of time. Uh, but when we talk about our economy and the jobs and the readiness that we have to uh, uh, be prepared to deal with with our workforce, a lot of talk now is around cybersecurity mm -hmm. and having a technology background and understanding the pieces of technology and cybersecurity and how uh, technical and detail oriented that field is. It really takes a whole lot of uh, study preparation and uh, commitment to have a workforce that's ready for you know those employers that we have that are looking for the, that type of worker and so the investment has to come not only in those potential future workers and the students that are in our community colleges or our colleges but um, you know this isn't you know just our everyday subject we need a uh, staff or professors or trainers who are equipped that can be able to give our workforce and the employers confidence that these folks that are being trained are being well prepared. So it's going to take, you know, not only the investment on the side of the students, but also to get those professors in our community colleges geared up and ready to be able to to train those and get them ready for the workforce. And Mr. Chairman, I think that's something the the governor highlighted in his State of the Commonwealth mm -hmm. address, those cybersecurity j jobs that are available now that can start as uh, high as $80,000 a year. Matter of fact, yesterday's timely topic, uh, the president of TCC was in my office mm -hmm. and uh, they announced yesterday, I believe the governor did, TCC is working directly with Old Dominion. That's Tidewater Community yes, College. Yes, sir, Tidewater Community College, and they are actually putting together a two plus two program mm -hmm. where you can get your your associates and then go get your bachelor. They got a pathway in two or three areas, and they're also working just to get the technical training. As Cliff was saying, uh, that a person might not want to have a degree but needs to have the competency to be able to you know work in that field, mm -hmm. and then they can work their way through up and decide like my brother to finally get his you know, engineering degree after you know, starting out in the apprentice school and going to TCC. So uh, I think a lot's being done, but it takes a concerted effort with the community working together and us you know, as legislators working with our colleagues in the, House, I mean, the Senate and the governor to have a, a comprehensive collective strategy across the Commonwealth to be able to, whatever the demand is for a job, to be able to meet that. Uh, continuing with our state employees, mm -hmm. uh, how's the state retirement uh, system doing? Doing well. Uh, part of the controversy coming into the session was the teachers did not want um, us to go to 100% in year two for the 100% required contribution for VRS. We did it last year for this first year of the budget, 17 for state employees, and we're going to go to 100% uh, in the second year, which means we'll be paying 100% of the rate that the board sets for the retirement plan, retirement plans that we have. It's doing very well. The reforms that we have. Uh, um, implemented in the last five to seven years have made a real difference. We did not put money in, as you know, back in 2011, I think in 12, but we've actually, we took a note against ourselves mm -hmm. for like a 10-year note. We paid that off last year. So the bond rating agencies thought that was a very good thing. So it's on solid ground. We're so dependent on earnings. So uh, I have a bill this year that the speaker and I've been working on, an optional defined contribution plan, which if it passes the uh, Senate uh, beginning in 2020, an employee, when they come to work with the state, could be able to go into a more portable retirement option, which would be like a 401k that you have mm -hmm. in your businesses. It requires a vesting over five years, 20%, 40, 60, 80, and 100. We think that with the new workforce that we have, the millennials, they're not going to be in the same job like many right. of we were, you know, <laughs> our, our age, for you know, 20, 30 years. So I think that's a good thing for us to look at. And, uh, but I'm very pleased with how we as an assembly have responded over the last probably five to eight years in that regard. Great. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about workforce development and the role that uh, our community colleges play in that regard. It's a tremendous opportunity for our community colleges to help mm -hmm. prepare that workforce that so many employers across the Commonwealth are looking for. Um, not only those current employers, but as we go out and we're trying to attract new employers to move to the Commonwealth, then they want to know that there's a workforce that's ready to handle the jobs of the future, not only the future, but now. 
Um, and then quite interesting enough, also, they need that foundation that's going to allow them to pivot or be, remain fluid, if you will, in those, uh, those areas. As we know, technology is changing, and it's changing at a rapid pace. So today, the issue might be cybersecurity. And as we're working in and around what we call the Internet of Things, we all see it every day. It's gradually moving into our daily lives in every aspect. We're going to be connected to the Internet. And obviously, the security of that infrastructure is uh, a priority. But who knows what's around the corner, even with the security uh, of the Internet. And, you know, it's limitless, I guess, what the possibilities can be as storage space, processing power, and all of that becomes cheaper and less expensive, then it starts to get us in a place where we can do some amazing things. And those careers that people are entering into now might just be, you know, a stepping stone to something else. We don't know what's around the corner. And that's how we have to be thinking, as Chairman Jones mentioned, those who are entering the workforce today are not going to be approaching it from the traditional aspect of, you know, I want that job that I'll be on and I'll be working for that employer or in that role for 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. um, that I believe that day is, is, is pretty much gone. It's going to be a more, if you will, uh, fluid environment where employees are looking to um, not only get expertise in where they are today, but as technology changes, they're going to be looking to also morph into other, other areas as well. Chairman Jones, uh, you mentioned a AAA bond rating mm -hmm. and the use of bonds in the past by the, by the Commonwealth. How important is, is it for the Commonwealth to keep that AAA bond rating? Well, we're an original AAA state, and we will always be a AAA state because we will do the things that we have to with our budget to make sure uh, that you know, we are doing the fiscally prudent things necessary. We've got to get our economy back where it needs to be, growing at more than a 2 2.5% 2 pace. And uh, we can get that going, we'll be in great shape. I want to make one comment on what Cliff made, uh, Delegate Hayes made about community colleges. Got to give a shout out for, uh, you know, Chuckatuck, Mills Godwin, 50th mm -hmm. anniversary this year of the community mm -hmm. college system. Mm -hmm. He was known as the father of the community college system. And uh, he would be very pleased to see where it's come mm -hmm. in the 50 years uh, with the technology and, and all the above. And then the last thing. Yesterday with TCC, they've got a three-week class now for welders that come in. All the ship repair folks have come together so they can get talent in, trained within three or four weeks, and they can be really on, on the job, you know, a couple, you know, weeks later earning money. Thank you both for being here, Doug, Cliff, Cliff Hayes and Chairman Chris Jones. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Charter Communications. Until next time, I am Woody Evans. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.